Hello, good afternoon, and thank you uh, for, for coming here today. Um, as the title suggests, I'm going to talk to you about um, challenges, and there are quite a few, uh, of uh, rapid prototyping coils. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There. Uh, for some time, we have seen uh, a number of companies um, uh, display interest in technologies in which um, they can print um, electrical traces uh, at low temperatures. This is a very interesting, very exciting technology. Opens up the possibility of uh, making circuits on paper, uh, on, on plastics. Uh, if you combine this with uh, pick and drop uh, manipulators, you can do uh, very cool things. Um, particular excitement is towards uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, this is a very sexy, very hot subject um, as far as the public is concerned. However, I'm not going to talk about this today. I'm going to talk about something a lot less exciting as far as the co 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 public is concerned just a good old coil, like those that most of you make here. Uh, they're not very exciting, but they sure make the world go round. The reason uh, why uh, I have an interest on, on, on rapid prototyping coils similar to this is because Weinberg Medical Company, uh, Physics, the company I work for, has developed uh, a very interesting set of capabilities. Now, I won't really elaborate on those um, today, uh, feel free to ask me questions afterwards. Uh, we have some publications uh, uh, on this, one of which uh, came out earlier this year. Uh, but we, for one thing, figure out how to circumvent a 120-year-old theorem that stated that you wouldn't be able to concentrate magnetic particles away from the magnet. So we're able to do this. This was published in, in, in a uh, January uh, Nano Letters uh, journal. Uh, we've developed uh, ultra-fast MRI technologies with potential of going 30 times faster than current MRI machines. This is disruptive. This is a big deal. We're talking brand new markets that don't exist currently. Neonatal procedures can be done. Uh, dental MRI, we're able to, to image uh, solids because we can, we can uh, map so quickly uh, that we can capture really interesting signals. Um, and so, what stands really between those markets and, and, and disrupting uh, um, these applications uh, and us are coils like this. Now, we are low production, um, and so we make our coils by hand. This is for an experimental setup. Um, as you know very well, uh, the number of turns that you make is very important. Uh, Mechanical integrity is very important for us. If, if, if uh, the wires shake a little bit, uh, the, the, the image or the quality of the experiments will not be as good. We're pushing the envelope here, so it, that, this cannot be a limiting factor for us. And we're running 400 amps through these things. This is not just 200 milliamps. We are carrying, we're not carrying information, we're carrying electrons and lots of it because we're using magnetic fields. Uh, so, uh, doing this is a real pain in the butt, and, and, and I have um, particle physicists all the time that whenever they, they see my work, they, they get really excited about this because um, they typically spend weeks on end having somebody manually winding the, 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 the coils. Um, I share this pain, I beg your pardon. This is my alarm to come here. Um, and so, whenever I'm tasked with something like this that is new, that no one has done before, that no one knows how to do, unfortunately, no one knows how to do this, because otherwise, we would have just simply bought them off. We're not in the coil business. We don't want to be in the coil business. We're doing this out of pain, that we can't figure out another way of, 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 of making this uh, happen for us. So whenever I'm, I'm given the task of um, figuring something uh, out that, that no one knows how to do, uh, which is what I do for a living. Um, I take, uh, I make good use of my ignorance. I ignorance is one of my main 
advantages. I'm blessed with ignorance. Uh, I don't know how to do these things. And so I simply take it from the top. And, and as I do this, uh, do please keep in mind that while uh, most of you are in the business of success in the sense that most of the things that you make work, 90, 95% of, of the products that come out of your factories do work. Uh, I am in the business of failure, meaning that I only work on things that fail, that are hard, no one else knows how to do. M many of my projects uh, fail. Uh, and, and so it takes a different type of mentality. Not, they don't fail because I'm not technically competent, but because they're just really difficult problems. So whenever you're facing something like that, you kind of have to step back and take everything from the top because sometimes you, you can spot things that other people might have missed in the past that perhaps now they can be realized and so on. And so uh, as I, I'm going to take you a little bit through that journey. So, so bear with me. So when you want to wrap a prototype a coil, you're going to need, of course, uh, conductors and insulator materials. Um, as far as conductors is concerned, it really becomes a matter of using superconductors or metals. Insulators, you have ceramics and polymers sort of straightforward. Let's take a close look at or a coarse look at, at these materials. So again, generally speaking, insulators, ceramics, they melt as low as 250 Celsius. Typically, you think much higher than that, but some ceramics do go fairly low. Uh, they like high temperatures, low ramps, and they're brittle. And I put a frowny face there, even though this is a professional presentation, frowny face, perhaps not the best thing to do. But I make it to make the point that it's just so very unfortunate. My life would be so much easier if ceramics wouldn't be brittle because they, they, they just like high temperatures. And so they, it would be relatively easy to integrate them with metals. But there are reasons uh, that make that difficult brittleness being central to them. Uh, in terms of polymers, uh, you have that if they melt, and not all polymers melt, about half of them will not, uh, uh, it will be below 250 Celsius. Uh, many will just simply decompose before then, and it's not pretty when it happens. Sometimes it's toxic fumes. It's not always just simply burning. Um, in terms of uh, conductors, uh, of course, we have superconductors, type 1, which uh, behave very nicely, mercury, lead. Uh, which are fairly easy to work with, behave as superconductors, but very low temperature. And it just makes them really difficult to deal with. So uh, again, the reason why I'm taking this, this, this perspective is because when you are thinking about how to wrap a prototype, uh, an electromagnetic coil, you don't think of mercury as a material becomes available. And it should be, because it, it may very well work. And it could very well work if you are, are OK at working at 10 degrees Kelvin. High temperature uh, semiconductors are ceramics. They like high temperatures. And the crystalline structure is very, very important for superconducting properties in ceramics. This makes them very difficult. There has been some, some effort uh, for some time on selective laser center in ceramics for superconducting applications. Uh, and, and this is something that they run up against. Uh, in terms of metal, Metals, they, they melt um, from room temperature, colder even, to 1,500 degrees Celsius as far as we are concerned. Other metals melt higher than that. Uh, and copper and, and silver, as, as you very well know, the best, the best choices. Uh, now, when, I, when I'm talking about uh, melting from room temperature on, uh, again, it, it may just sound a little obvious, but, but say that you were to uh, deposit copper powder. And then um, you can take gallium. And I have here a little vial with gallium, which me melts at about body temperature. It's very curious material. The solid is less dense than the liquid. So if you know, there's a piece floating, so feel free to, to play with it. It's, it's not very toxic. It's similar to aluminum. Uh, interesting material. But then the concept, perhaps, of, of taking silver particles uh, and inkjetting gallium becomes a possibility. Why not? Really, why not? And so when, when you really start putting, putting all the pieces on the table and, and seeing really what you can do without prejudices, uh, prejudices, then you really have an edge when you're developing something new. It's a lot of fun, let me tell you. OK, so as far as depositing uh, 
uh, metals, there is a long list of, of techniques. I'm not going to go uh, over all of them. Uh, each of them, you will know, have uh, different shortcomings and advantages and characteristics, and we can talk offline about them. Um, but um, some of the different approaches uh, that they included um, are robots, similar to some of those that we see uh, here in this floor. Uh, the University of Texas El Paso has an effort to rapid uh, 3D print or rapid prototype an entire motor uh, from scratch, and so they're developing some interesting techniques of embedding wires inside of um, uh, inside of plastic parts that they have 3D printed uh, prior before then. Uh, lamination is a technique that has been around for some time. Uh, Thin Gap, an American company, makes uh, motors uh, with them, high density motors. They're really, really good. They take sheets and laser cut them uh, so that the metal remaining is, is the wires that you wind. You rum, roll them up. Uh, a Weinberg medical physics uh, for our, our um, gradient, magnetic gradient coils for MRI uh, purposes. Uh, we use lamination as well, PCBs. But with lamination, something that happens is it, it, it is fairly straightforward, but the minute that you start putting many layers, it, it just, the, the engineering challenges be, uh, grow exponentially, very, very quickly, and it becomes very, very expensive. And so, you know, it may work for you, but it also has some shortcomings. But what if you wanted to uh, make wires that have, for example, um, cooling channels on the inside of the wire? We know that uh, metals uh, resistivity increases significantly with temperature. What if you were to able, able to run liquid nitrogen through the inside of your wire to cool it down? It drops the, the, the resistance by a factor of 10. Uh, what if you wanted to, to integrate uh, your LITS wires very tightly with your connectors and so make LITS wires that have zero, uh, zero radius of curvature so you can use every space available within the, the tight confinement? Uh, things like uh, increasing the, the, the packing density of devices by making um, wires that have variable diameter. So, uh, once you start considering these things, well, uh, things like lamination don't, don't, don't quite cut it. So, so uh, something that comes to mind naturally is to use some of these inkjet uh, inks uh, that, that I showed earlier uh, in, in the presentation, in which you, you can print it on paper. The problem with that is if you want to run hundreds of amps, you need thick wires. And the wires I'm producing right now are about a millimeter thick. Again, we're talking 400 amps. Uh, after you deposit a number of these layers, uh, they start peeling off. They're not really meant for this. They're not really designed for that. The, the solvent content, for one thing, is really high. It's about 97 or so percent by volume. So it, it, that approach didn't work out very well. Um, what about graphene or carbon nanotubes? There was a lot of excitement about carbon nanotubes just a few years ago. Now it's graphene. Hey, it's a super amazing conducting material. Why not use it? So something that, that is often conveniently not mentioned about carbon nanotubes and, and graphene is that they have very, very good electrical and mechanical properties uh, when they have a single, pristine, perfect carbon structure. The problem with that is uh, getting electrons out of that carbon structure onto the next carbon structure is very difficult. And, and that means and that uh, it, while a single carbon nanotubes has really good electrical mechanical properties, bundles of them do not. Uh, something that people have been doing for some time is they introduce defects in the carbon nanotube through acid treatment, for example, sulfuric acid. And then uh, you make covalent linkages between different graphene sheets or, or carbon nanotubes. And that works m very well for, for improving the electrical properties. Uh, but by introducing uh, these defects, then you, you, you ruin the mechanical properties of the carbon nanotube. So it, it's a trade-off. So th there is no free lunch with them. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is unlikely that in the foreseeable future, at least, uh, you will see um, carbon nanotubes and graphene used in microscopic applications. Uh, conductive um, epoxies, by virtue of making um, uh, composites, 
uh, is something that also comes to mind. Uh, most of you uh, already know, but again, just take it from the top. Know that there really are two, two uh, regimes to, to this. Um, if you put very few particles in a lot of matrix or epoxy, say, uh, you have very good mechanical properties. If you have a lot of, um, and of course, poor electrical properties, if you put a lot of, uh, say, your conducting particles, whether it's silver or copper, silver most likely, uh, you'll have better conductivity, uh, but it will crumble away because it just doesn't have enough glue to hold it together. Um, the sweet spot is in the middle, but it also not only means you have the best of both worlds, but you also have the, both, the worst of both worlds. So if you're interested in, in electrical conductivity, which we are, once again, 400, 500 amps, you need to cool this thing. MRI machine has a big room where the MRI machine lies, and right next to it there's a bigger room still filled with equipment to cool this whole thing down. So if you have greater resistance for a coil, that room grows much, much bigger still. Uh, so if, if you're interested in, in conductivity, really there's nothing better other than just bulk metal. Well, superconductors, I suppose. But, and, and this is something that we all sort of knew intuitively, but it's good to just kind of check. It's a reality check. Uh, conductive polymers, for one, it looks sort of attractive, but uh, in reality, they're very unstable uh, to, to oxygen, and they degrade fairly quickly. Many challenges with them as well. I worked with them uh, early on in my career. So really, it's a matter of getting bulk metals. How do you get bulk metals in this? Uh, and so uh, not even every metal, after all. Uh, this is a, a, a plot of the melting point versus electrical conductivity. If we just look at the uh, electrical conductivity, and again, this is something that you all know for the most part, but silver and copper are well ahead of every other metal in terms of electrical properties. Gold, aluminum, a little bit better, and then there's the rest. And so uh, if you're going to start adding things such as iron or beryllium, you might as well add gallium because, well, it just melts at lower temperature, melts at body temperature. So when you start looking at all these things, well, okay, well, the, the answer then here is silver, copper, maybe gold. Uh, how do we then make metal, metal wires? And there are a number, wide uh, range of, of uh, technologies on how you can do this. Uh, cladding is a technology that is 30 or 40 years old uh, as it was made. It's not very well known. Um, and what you do is you, you spray metal powder and you have a, a laser beam there in the middle that melts the particles in flight, and so by the time they reach the substrate, is molten metal, so it's almost like spraying molten metal with a hose. It's pretty neat, I, frankly, I, I find it really exciting. You can make some really neat um, uh, structures with it, um, because, again, you're spraying liquid metal, essentially, as you can see the, the aspect ratio you can form. Um, um, another approach is selective laser sintering, which can also go by many names, which makes it unnecessarily confusing. So depending on different, different companies, name it different things for, I think it's for commercialization purposes. So you can use a laser beam. Uh, it is a very difficult process, just lasers in general, because uh, you're starting off with a powder that has a particular, a, a given absorptivity just because of its shape. It's a powder, it's more opaque. Uh, and, and as you melt it, it turns shinier. And so um, it, it doesn't absorb as much as energy. At the same time, it becomes a solid, so it conducts heat into the powder more than before. And so you, you have these really complicated, nonlinear phenomena pulling things one way or another, and it just makes it really, really difficult. It, 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 it can produce in these keyhole geometries or balling or a number of other things. Um, and, and so it makes it really tricky. And uh, Professor Gideon Levy, he, in a presentation he gave uh, earlier in the year, uh, illustrated this very well. I borrow his slide. Uh, he's presenting a, generally speaking, a, a um, let's call it a um, prototypical metal uh, absorption profile as a function of wavelength in an insulator. Now, historically, uh, metallurgic industry has been using CO2 lasers uh, at 10.5 micron wavelength. That's infrared. 
Uh, this is a terrible wavelength to use. As you can see in the solid line, the, the, the absorption is really, really low. And the reason why they do this is because they're cheap and it's easy to make them very, very high power. So you just brute force your way in. But if you want to combine it with an insulator, you're going to have the situation where the insulator absorbs far more of the radiation than the metal you're trying to melt. So there's no discernation. There's no, you're not able to, to melt one versus the other. Uh, more recently, uh, the industry has been switching to shorter wavelengths, 1080. Uh, um, 1080 nanometer is, is typical for YAG lasers. Still not a particularly good choice, and this is the point that Professor Levy was making. Uh, when, once you start going to shorter uh, wavelengths still, um, then things really just make better sense if you, if you actually look at the properties. And then, uh, now, a krypton fluoride laser, I mean, geez, who's ever even heard of that? I sure haven't. I've never seen one. Shorter wavelengths become more complicated. But the recent, and again, this is taken from the top, uh, recent development uh, in, in technologies make it so that some of these lasers become available. Um, gallium arsenide, blue LED, blue lasers, for that matter, um, are possible nowadays. Uh, very high, high between quotation marks, are fairly available and inexpensive. In one experiment, I melted tungsten, a well-known high temperature metal, with a one watt laser, 405 nanometer laser. This came out of, out of a Blu-ray blue, blue disc player. So this is not some crazy military technology. This just came out of something that you go and buy at medium art. Now, if using lasers to melt metal is very nonlinear, very tricky. A lot of engineering needs to go into it. Um, th there is a little bit of a cheat that may just be good enough. Uh, this over here is an SEM, Scanning Electron Microscopy Picture. It's essentially a, 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 just a microscope picture, but instead of light, you're using an, a, like a, an old TV electron beam that you raster around. Um, these are particles, silver dust. Flakes, they're really jagged, as you can see. They're just all over. It's just a, a pile of dust, essentially. But something remarkable happens when you heat this up to a few hundred degrees Celsius. It fuses together. Again, a few hundred degrees Celsius. This is not, the silver melts at 943 degrees. This is not nearly there. Uh, the atoms on the surface, because the particles are small enough, and again, these are not nanoparticles, these are micron size. Uh, they are produced by atomizing molten silver, allowing it to settle, and then you roll it with a pin, so you flatten up a little disk, 10 microns. Um, you, you heat them up, and, and they diffuse into each other, and they, they fuse e e each other. And you do see a lot of voids, true. You also only heated it up to three or 400 Celsius. That's not bad. Furthermore, you can play certain tricks uh, with particles of different sizes and, and, and increase the packing density of these structures. So this really offers um, an, an attractive uh, avenue for this. And, and uh, in truth, you're, you're not going to get bulk conductivity. But it may, well, it, it, I wanted to also show what happens when when you increase the temperature, uh, again, even at 300 degrees Celsius, 400 degrees Celsius, you start seeing some of the benefits. Uh, a, for these curves, um, I, I, I heated the metal for less than 10 minutes, like five minutes. If you leave them for about half an hour, you get 80 to 90% of the, of the benefit that you will get to that temperature. And the hotter that you heat it up, the better. Now, this is not well characterized. Humans just don't know this very well. And this is where having an army of engineers doing this for you would be very handy. Um, now, this approach, while it will not give you bulk metal um, conductivity, it may just be good enough. Uh, I'm having here, I'm showing copper wire at 60% packing density, which granted is slow, but say perhaps a device, electrical device like uh, this um, inductor here, will have a fairly low packing density. Uh, if you're able to use this 50% silver, 50% air uh, composite or structure, uh, you may be able to, you will be able to, to increase its packing density because the wires don't need to be round. They can be square and they can be wider in the parts where you have more space. So 
doesn't have the same conductivity as bulk silver, as a wire, as a copper wire. But you know, it, it does can fight with it. So we're really approaching that, that level of, well, this is, you know, we, we have something here that it can actually compete under certain conditions. Um, so that's what's going on on the side of conductors. Uh, in terms of insulators, so a good insulator will have very good dielectric strength, very high resistivity. Uh, diamond is a very nice choice. Don't rule it out. Our coils, if they work, they will be far more valuable than silver and diamond that would be used to build them. Uh, diamond is a bit of a pain in the butt to, to deposit. Uh, you use CVD chemical vapor deposition techniques. It takes forever. It's in a vacuum chamber, high temperature, higher than the melting uh, point of many metals, surely those that are of conductivity interest to us. So OK, that's you know, on its own over there. And I put a semiconductor because it's, it's considered a wide band gap semiconductor. And I think I'll just leave that for a different conversation. But something that stands out is that not much stands out. Uh, ceramics and polymers are roughly banded together in a region. And so, OK, ceramics being difficult to work with because of their brittleness and their slow ramp, you know, forget that. Let's go with polymers. It is, after all, what you guys have done using MNL, for example, to coat or captain or pulley image. Uh, but you probably already know that um, the decomposition, or let's call it the service temperature uh, for polymers, uh, tends to be, for most of them, is not higher than 300 degrees Celsius. Many of them decompose well before then. Uh, nasty smells, poisonous gases, Teflon is not good to breathe when it's burning, people. Uh, and once you start getting high temperatures, 300, 400, perhaps even higher, that ideally you, you will get higher in order to, to get all the, all the conductivity that we want. Uh, very few polymers remain in the list. The list becomes really, really short, really, really quickly. And I can count them with one hand. Um, and so if you're going to select a polymer, if you need to go into this whole thing of, of, of a high performance polymers, uh, well, you, you, need to, you need to understand polymers a little bit. Now, it is well known that there is no faster way of losing an audience than putting chemical structures on the, on the board. So I'll just move past that. And let's just use a little bit of caricatures here. All that you really need to know about polymer. Polymer physics is a lot of fun. It's not chemistry. It's really, it's more like a Christmas light sort of system. You have this ball of... of of, of yarn with adornments on it, and the adornments interact with each other in different ways. Um, these green things like to stack on top of each other, similar to magnets, if you will. They, you know, they, they like to form structures. Um, oops, sorry. Got a little out of there. Goodness. Um, these blue balls attract the red balls, and, and they repel each other, and, and, and so on. There, there, there's a, a set of rules that uh, you can sort of grasp at a very high level, and, and you have a pretty good idea of, of what is going on. Uh, some of the polymers, for example, these over here are thermoplastics, meaning that it's like spaghetti carbonara. You know, you, you pull them apart, and they slowly go. If you cool them down, they, they are harder to pull. If you heat them up, they flow very easily. Uh, they creep, which can be a problem for some applications. Other of them uh, are like uh, spaghetti bolognese after you left it in the fridge for a few days. Uh, wherever you have two of these strands together, they fuse together. And if you try to pull this apart, it will not. It, it, will, it will break. Um, those are thermosetting plastics. And those are the ones that they don't really melt. They, de they decompose. Um, now, once you start then looking into high, um, high performance polymers, uh, these structures uh, in, in the shape of the polymer is very important. And I know that this may not be something that you really want to know, but you do have to understand that to some level if you want to understand the challenges associated with um, rapid prototyping coils. Uh, high performance polymers have this tendency to to, to stack in very organized ways. They're called uh, oftentimes semi-crystalline polymers. Uh, this guy over here, polycyarinate, is used in warhead missile c 
cones. Uh, peak, 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 peak cave, there are all sorts of variations depending on how you order them, but, but it's a family of polyether ketones. Uh, they have, once again, a, a range of exotic applications. You don't find it everywhere. You may be more familiar with a polyimide. Captain is but one uh, brand name of it. Uh, all these polymers arrange themselves in, into these structures that are very stable. And so if you heat them up, and you can think of heat as shaking, shaking up. So again, you have this ball of Christmas lights, and you start shaking it really hard, and then suddenly light bulbs start coming off, and, and so it becomes a mess. But these Christmas lights, they, they stack it with each other very nicely. They really like each other. And so you can shake them to very high temperatures, and they'll still survive. This is key. This is very important to understand their behavior. Uh, from that stems that if you have relatively low quality materials, uh, that is to say that um, the, the polymer chain is not always uniform. It has a kink over here, a kink over there, or, or a broad range of, of lens, or you have a little bit of waste uh, in there. It's not going to behave the way that you would expect it to. And this is a major challenge. Take, for example, polyimide. All of these wacky shapes that you see here are considered polyimides. So if you go and you say, well, I'm going to use a polyimide because they reach high temperature, you take one, you heat it up, and it doesn't, you know, it just burns at 300 Celsius, that's not the end of the story. Because it, it, it could just be that it was a cheap kind or that it was optimized for something else. And it can vary greatly. It can vary from, from batch to batch. Um, these polymers, companies only make a little bit of it. It goes bad after a certain number of months. Uh, so different batches can have different um, properties to, to some degree, very nonlinear results. Expert controls uh, make it a, a, a difficult for you sometimes to, to get the whole of certain um, samples. For example, whenever I'm approaching European companies uh, for, to get um, similar materials, Lone Size, one company that kindly has offered me some, some of the materials. They rather send you samples for free than to sell them because of the expert controls. If you buy them in the States, you have to sign paperwork saying that you will not send it to North Korea. Uh, that is a barrier that it's there for you. And that is a challenge for, for this thing. Uh, only a handful of companies uh, offer this stuff. Sometimes it takes me a month or two to, just to get a, 100 grams of a given sample. Again, this is not something that you it's not necessarily a technical challenge, but it is there, and it makes your life difficult. It takes you forever. Sometimes you know more about the properties of the material that you're working with than the manufacturer themselves, because you're doing things to it that they don't know. I'm, I'm told, for example, that certain solvents will work um, on, on a given mixture, and they don't. So I have to find a, a, my own solvent. And some of these polyimides are, are very, they're very picky on what get they dissolved. Uh, one formulation in particular, for example, uh, the, the solvent that it comes in, and this is pre imidized polyimide, uh, is the, the solvent is a precursor for a rape drug, so you cannot get it unless you get clearance from the FBI. So there's only one other, the, the manufacturer suggested two other solvents, only one of them actually works. Cyclohexanone, this thing is nasty. It eats right through your nitro gloves. So you really could do without all these hurdles that are just there to make your life more difficult. So these are, these are the challenges, and I think they can be summarized uh, very briefly. In, uh, well, number one, better conductivities call for higher temperatures. Doesn't matter which uh, technology, whether you're using a powder or you're using a laser to melt the thing fully, you need high temperatures to get good conductivities, period. How you get that, that's one of the challenges. Polymers don't like this. We already knew this, but now we understand it to a new level. And we also understand now that 400 Celsius, perhaps even 400 Celsius for a short amount of times, is possible. And all ceramic superconductor insulator coils are intriguing proposition. The bottom line is that 3D printing coils is possible. But it surely is a challenge, as I just outlined. And there will be limitations. It's going to take time. How much time? Well, people always ask, especially business development people ask. I they say two to 10 years. It's a wide range, but the reason is because it depends on how many engineers are you willing to throw at this problem. But it is possible. You can engineer your way through these challenges that I outline. Um, however, when I see possible challenge and limitations in the same sentence, what I see really are opportunities. 
the fact that there are barriers of entry into this technology, that means there are opportunities. And, and it really boils down to, are the things that you want to do with this worth you going through the trouble of doing it? Because there are, we are, there, there's a, an entire floor of people doing very, very good coils that are competed against you. So the, the applications that you want to give uh, if, um, the approach uh, uh, with this technology have to be something that they cannot do. And trust me, there is plenty. Um, but you just have to be aware of that.